Uh, Kate Moss, welcome again to uh, Time Team. Lovely to see you. I've had great fun reading The City of Tears. Well, I suppose fun is maybe not the word. <laughs> maybe uh, not quite the word. Yes, there's a lot I, of massacres in it. <laughs> I was gripped by it, but also I felt I was in a world that we know so little about. that It's almost like we understand the Reformation, but here thousands of Protestants and Catholics dying in wars of religions, and you entered into that, that world. Did it, did it sort of, did, was there a point when you came a bit depressed by humanity <laughs> doing it? What kept you going through this massacre followed by massacre? Well, yes. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm delighted you enjoyed it. It's, um, you know, it's a book very dear to my heart. I really enjoyed writing it, actually. Um, so the thing is that I think anybody who knows anything about the French Wars of Religion, the one thing they know is the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre um, in August 1572 in Paris. And it followed a few days after the wedding of the Catholic Marguerite de Valois uh, to the Huguenot Henry of Navarre a marriage that had been brokered by the two queens, their two mothers, Catherine de Medici and Jeanne d'Albret. And then a few weeks before the wedding, in June, Jeanne d'Albret died suddenly in Paris. And rumours were very, very rife that Catherine de Medici had poisoned her or that somebody else had in order to stop the wedding going ahead because it would be the two great dynasties, the Bourbon and the Valois, joining together. And so I knew that at the heart, at the beginning, I suppose, of the heart of the City of Tears, I was going to need to put my imaginary family in front of the backdrop of this terrible, terrible uh, day and night, uh, St. Bartholomew's Day, 24th of August, when maybe, we don't know, but it was an active attempt to wipe out the Huguenot leadership, which then got out of hand. So some 3,000 people died that day. And they were trapped, you know, the gates were all shut, there were chains pulled across the streets, um, the Catholic doors were daubed with white crosses and Catholics wore white armbands on there to distinguish them. And it was wholesale slaughter. And even more, as you say, more depressingly, there were then maybe 70,000 people, possibly, we, we will never know really, um, who died in copycat massacres, the length and breadth of France in the next two weeks. And my imaginary family, uh, you know, flee Paris. And when I started to write that scene, I didn't know who would go to Paris in the first place. And I didn't know who would escape from Paris um, because that's the thing for me about being a historical novelist and why it's not depressing is that I am, of course, putting the real history on the page, but my concern is what's happening to my people. And of course, there is a tragedy that befalls my family on that day, which is entirely separate from the historical record. And I think without giving too much away, um, I would say that there's a rather nice denouement to some of those stories, which is, I, I very much enjoyed um, Minou and Piet. And of course, you had that essential wonderful thing about stories, you had a wonderful baddie, um, <laughs> Vidal, Yes. Uh, with his black hair with a white streak in it, which is sort of passed down through the family, I think, a bit. Um, and I rather attached myself interest-wise to Vidal because he had what you know, as we've talked before about this, um, archaeologists are marginally obsessed about artefacts. Yes. <laughs> and, and I have to admit, in the middle of all that history, I clutched on to the terrible Vidal's collection of reliquies. And again, we won't give too much away, but the business of obtaining things. Where did that idea come from, that, that, that if you have the relics, you have the power? Was that an original thought that you brought in? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that is hugely at odds between the Protestants in all countries, you know, they're Calvinists in uh, in the lowlands, they are uh, Noxians in Scotland, they are Protestants in England, and in France, they're Huguenots. But if we was the, the central place in Catholicism uh, for relics, and of course, you know, they could be relics that were from an object like a piece of the cross or uh, the crown of thorns, which features in um, the City of Tears, but they also could be things that were rather more 
uh, macabre, I suppose, like uh, the finger of a saint, you know, a child old finger of a saint or, a, you know, you know, any any body part actually was very was very sought after. Yeah. And so I, I knew that I wanted to make some an exciting story out of this and also the business of relics and buying and selling relics and fake relics and, uh, you know, authentic you know, authentication and all of these was was huge business. But it was actually the reason that I kind of have this subplot with Vidal, who is, as you say, creating his own um, reliquary, was to discover that in this period in the 16th century, that there had only been seven stations of the cross and that the Catholic Church, you know, almost like a pushback against the rising popularity of Protestantism, decided that it, maybe they could tell a better story if they had more Stations of the Cross. So some of the ones that we think of as most iconic um, were only added as a kind of political decision. You know, this, this is a better story than the one we've been telling. So I was fascinated by that, and I'm fascinated by the idea that an object has a power. You know, for all of us who love Indiana Jones, you know, it's still, it's still that, the Holy Grail, the Last Crusade, and all of these things. And the idea that if... If people believe that an object has a power, then does it have a power? Or is there some sort of genuine sacred thing like the veil of Veronica or the Turin shroud, uh, which only exists in the genuine article, if you like. So I've always been interested in relics and objects from the past and what they can tell us and what they hold. So um, it, you know, it seemed a very obvious storyline to follow for this. And of course, you know, I'm familiar, you know, in Britain, we have the legend of the 12 objects of Merlin um, from the Celtic legends, which included shields and swords. So that tradition of, of and in a sense, then Tolkien picks it up with the rings that you have yes. to find. And by gathering these things, and um, uh, again, without going into too much detail, there's a spectacular scene which is very memorable at the end which is the outcome of, of all this gathering together of power um, and I thought as well that the the process of some of those objects I wondered how um, realistic they were was that I, I think we can talk about this without giving too much away yes I think so absolutely um, the shroud of Antioch uh, which I had not heard of before the Sancta Comisia um, the Can we spine, say yes from Chartres? Yep. Mine from the Crown of Thorns. How 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 real was that list of artifacts? Th th they are all real. They're all relics that were um, either being talked about or being lost uh, during this time period. Um, and of course, in book one of this series, the Burning Chambers, um, it you know there is a relic. Um, you know, a sort of a, a sacred sort of a piece of cloth uh, that goes missing. And what I what I do is always I look, I do my research, and I discover that certain things did go missing. Uh, so, um, you know, from from the uh, the Eglise du Tour in Toulouse, the you know the relic they possessed somehow vanished. Nobody quite knows where. There were lots and lots of uh, people in this period in the 16th century talking about spines from the crown of thorns. You know, it, it's like that that old, uh, not joke really, but they, that old saying that if you put together all the pieces of the so-called true cross, you could girdle the earth several times, you know. Um, so it would, obviously they can't all have been from the true cross. Um, but certainly the Veil of Veronica and the Sancta Camicia from Chartres Cathedral. Um, I write about Chartres in my novel Labyrinth, and I really wanted to go back there, partly because um, the great French King Henry IV will be crowned in Chartres in 1594. And that's not normally where the kings of France were crowned. So it seemed a great opportunity to bring all of these things together. Um, so I think, I think, like you, like me, all of us who are interested in the past, who are either archaeologists or archaeologists monke, um, we are very interested in the provenance of objects and how they can be proved and, and ratified, I suppose. Because I think you, you bring up that idea very interestingly, because you have both a character who's willing to collect, but also a character who's willing to fake. Yes. And yes. Uh, if you can't find it, get your own maid. Um, I've just wondered, in your, in your research and in your passage through things, have you come across objects that have personally spoken to you across time? Are there some things which have, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about an object that I came across some time ago, but 
are there ones that you slightly sort of almost like a portal into the past or an emotional? I think for me, um, mostly the objects that speak to me are books. Uh, so when the inspiration for the series, um, The Burning Chambers, first came to me, it was 2010, and I was in the Huguenot Memorial Museum in Franschhoek in South Africa. And I knew that it was punishable by death um, to own a copy of the Bible in French. This was another large part of the conflict um, between Catholics and Huguenots, was the right to worship in one's own language, which seems so obvious now, but it was, it was you know, a, a, a heresy. To, to want to do so back then. And so people took great pains, but also put themselves in great danger to smuggle Bibles out. And I had read about a Bible being smuggled in a loaf of bread and I hadn't really been able to kind of comprehend it. And then I saw this tiny Bible. And of course, then you thought, well, of course that would fit inside a loaf of bread. And I mean, minute writing, beautiful, um, you know, sort of picked out letters in gold and red and, uh, and a beautiful Bible, but, you know, the size of my hand, um, you know, so, well, you know, just the palm of my hand. Um, I also find, I particularly find shoes very moving uh, because often it reminds you that the average height of a woman or a man was, was lower than it is now. And so you often see very, very tiny shoes. And the, the fact that we take, it sounds so daft, but we take shoes that are functional for granted, that they won't let the rain in, um, that they will be sturdy enough for us to go walking across the marshes and the woods that, you know, that you and I do a lot of this kind of striding about. And then you see the sort of shoes that people were wearing. In the 16th century, there was this great new invention that everybody was talking about that had come from the French court, which was heels just a tiny heel. So I think for me, it's objects that speak to a human being's experience, what it would have been like to live then, you know, cloak, uh, buckle for a cloak, for example. Um, and they tend to speak to me more than weapons do or pieces of furniture, because it's, it's always the idea of an individual person who by just by touching that object, they start to spring to life. It reminds me a little bit of, of one of the origins of archaeology some people refer to was the business of monks looking for relics. Yes. That search for the body remains of a saint which could make your particular priory a lot of money if you got the right saint. Yes, and, and yes absolutely. Yes. And, it, and it's all part of the, you know, what we now would call the tourist attraction. You know, uh, sort of incredibly important. The stream of pilgrimages, you know, pilgrims going to Chartres, obviously for the lab labyrinth, but also for the Sancta Comitia. Um, and that was a huge part of the pilgrim trail was people going to see relics. So it, it was it was big business. Relics were big business. And this is why I, you know, I wanted it at the heart of my story, because I, I felt that this was an appropriate time uh, to, to kind of share those stories. And of course, as you say, Vidal, you know, his, his, his intentions are nefarious and they are about his own glorification and sanctification, not the service of the church. I think I can still tell that these people are still with you. Well, yes. <laughs> I, I mean, partly because I'm obviously talking about them. You know, the book's only just come out and, um, and, and that's been wonderful to, to see the characters out in the world because, because of the situation that we're all in. Um, the book has been quite significantly delayed in its publication. So I felt in a way that the characters have been standing in the wings of a dusty theatre, gathering dust. Um, and I've been wanting to get them out there um, and to have people to talk to about them. Because for me, the most exciting thing about publishing a novel is meeting readers and talking to readers. And of course, it's the one thing that has not been possible. Although there's been so many opportunities to talk like we're talking now um, on Zoom or anything else. So it's not that I haven't been able to actually talk about the book, but it's still it's still a thrill. It's still early in its, its public life, if you like. And I know that, that, that you have some interesting perspectives on female writers, female characters. And here you had um, Minou. Minou. Yes, um, Minou. And, and her daughter, who, who uh, we'll find more about in the book, and Piet. And in a way, the, the conflict was played out through that couple. Yes. And, and was she the character that you identified with or you felt closest to in the book? 
No, I never identify with any of my characters, actually. Um, they are all distinctly themselves, unless they feel separate from me. I can't really write them um, in the way that they need to be written. Um, so it's, they all feel like um, actors on a stage, and except that the actors decide where they go and stand. Um, so it's a, you know, they often are in conflict with me. You know, I think, oh, what, what, what why is that happening? This, you know, they've gone off in this direction. And, you know, at the heart of, there's, there's a, a deep personal tragedy at the heart of this story, uh, which is not what I was expecting the story to be, but that is the story the characters told. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm fond of all my characters as uh, the people that carry the story forward. But I don't actually have more affection for some more than others, except every now and again, I'm very, very fond of Aunt Salvadora, um, who is an older generation and, you know, a, a woman. I always like to write older characters and uh, I'm very fond of her. And actually, I became very fond of the Dutch young woman who becomes their, the Joubert family saviour in a way, helps them to flee Paris and helps them to find and build a new home in Amsterdam, which is the City of Tears of the title, because most of the book is set in Amsterdam. Uh, and her name is uh, Cornelia van der Rye. And I'm very fond of her, actually. Um, and she was a character that I just needed. But the more I wrote her, the more she kind of took up page space. You know, her boots were big boots once she got them. Uh, it was nice for me to see Carcassonne there again a little bit, a particular part of Carcassonne, and Alice, um, Alice made a reappearance. Uh, what was it like and why did you choose that particular part of Carcassonne to focus on? Well, I think you write the story as it needs to be written. It, it sounds really daft, but I never sit back and think, oh, I would like to write some scenes set down in Languedoc because that's my you know, love affair is with that part of France. Or I would like to write scenes set in Chartres. I, or, I'm always thinking, what does this story need? Um, and that's what drives it forward because plot and character and place for me are indistinguishable. Um, you know, they are all equal players in this. And so I, I can't imagine not, you know, book three, there, were, there won't be any France, um, which will be, the first time in a very long time that I that there hasn't been even a tiny suggestion of France in one of my historical fiction. I thought you had some clause um, but, in your contract from the Carcassonne. Tour. Yes, exactly. It's on tourist board. Absolutely. Yes, they're going to be jolly cross with me. Um, I might be able to sneak a little bit of backstory in, I suppose. Uh, but it, so it's it's really that, Tim. It's about what does the story need? Where do we need to be? Finding out the real history. I mentioned Chartres. The real history gives me an opportunity to be in Chartres because I know that Henry IV will bring peace to France after a generation of bitter religious civil war and he will be crowned there. So it makes sense to choose Chartres. Um, so there's always a reason beyond my emotion for a place. I, uh, as usual, I always ask you this question that um, we talked about archaeological sites in Carcassonne. Being an archaeologist, I'm going to give you we have a project, a sort of informal project called AURA, the Authors Unit for Research into Archaeology. If I gave you time to for a week or so and you could take them to anywhere in this novel, The City of Tears, is there one location that you would like to, I suppose, in a sense, literally dig into or discover the physical remains of? Is there one place? Well, do you know... Um... Yes, there is. And it is, in fact, in Amsterdam. And I loved being in Amsterdam. I was lucky enough to be given a writer's, visiting writer's fellowship by the Dutch Literature Foundation to research for the City of Tears. And I therefore was able to live and, you know, in Amsterdam on and off um, for a month in 2019 researching the book. And the novel starts with an old sister, a lay sister, kneeling at the altar of their the chapel of their orders chapel they're, they're not um they're not nuns they are lay sisters but they are affiliated to the catholic church and the old nun madiken has been keeping a secret for a very long time and now the time has come the time of reckoning has come and she is praying for guidance and um you know it's the beginning of what is there's a high body count in this novel shall we say um but the place that this is all happening, the lay sisterhood, 
is a place called Begeinhof, uh, which is in the heart of Amsterdam, um, just in an area called Spo. And it was just above where I was living at the time. And it was started as a lay sisterhood in the 14th century. And most of the houses were destroyed in the terrible fires that whipped through Amsterdam. Most of the houses were wooden houses um, in the 15th century. But there is still one, Het um, Houtenhuis, the wooden house, which is in uh, the courtyard, the beautiful uh, garden courtyard. Most of the houses there now are 17th century. And the church um, is a more modern church. It dates from 1607 uh, because the chapel was taken away uh, from the lay sisters when Amsterdam fell to the Calvinists in May 1578. And that's also at the heart of my novel. But to excavate the original Begeinhof, uh, to go back to the medieval period, to try and, because most of that in Amsterdam is invisible now because of it being, the, the houses being wooden and the fires. Um, and I would love to be able to recreate what it looked like when it was built, that extraordinary stone cloister um, for these lay sisters. Um, and imagining them all, they always wore a very distinctive grey outfit and a grey headdress called a fali. Um, and to, uh, to find out what the chapel looked like um, and from records and the archives, I discovered that there were lots of thorn bushes there and actually maybe some water. So the idea of the Begeinhof now is very much a 17th century um, environment, I suppose. But I would like to know the original Begeinhof. Well, that's certainly one we should put on your fantasy list. Um, Thank you. A couple. And I'm going to be sending you some information about a previous site you were interested in. Um, I have a thought about an object which I saw um, in a dusty museum many years ago in the north of England. And it's about the power of objects, which this book reflects so much. And it was a thorn from the crown of thorns. Oh, really? And it was in a glass file with a beautiful silver and gold mount. And it was the thorn that Mary, Queen of Scots, carried with her, her life, for yeah. her life, and finally was taken from her after she'd been beheaded and made its way to this museum. And the, wow. st the story, and you mentioned provenance uh, and thorns, the, 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 the crown of thorns that survived the recent fire in Paris. Yes. And Notre Dame. And apparently Louis at the time, when he thought Mary Queen of Scots was going to rescue Catholicism in Britain, uh, snapped off one of these thorns and gave it to Mary Queen of Scots. And she, it never left her position from that wow. time she died. Yeah. Well, uh, that's so fascinating, of course, because Mary Queen of Scots was um, engaged as a child, really, or betrothed as a child, uh, to one of the children of Francis I, the great French king. And of course, a combination of Francis dying and, you know, then that didn't go ahead, but she very easily could have been Queen of France. And of course, the crown of thorns is beloved of the French monarchy. It was kind of used to raise up the idea of the king as godhead. And the, the story goes, and, uh, and there's quite a lot of evidence for this, that that the Sainte Chapelle was built in, you know, on, on the Ile de, de France in order to house the crown of thorns, and that St. Louis himself, king, um, in you know, in the 13th century, went to the borders of his kingdom in order to carry it himself. Um, and this is where people see the modern French monarchy, the idea of, you know, the the king is chosen directly by God. So the crown of thorns is so important in French history, but I didn't know that about Mary, Queen of Scots, so that's fascinating. Well, I'll perhaps send you a picture of the... Love to see one, yes, yes. And it has extremely good provenance for various reasons, yeah, which yeah. I'll tell you about. Um, Kate, uh, I, I'm pleased to say that we've had a lot of support uh, for Time Team coming back. Great. <laughs> and, and it actually looks like we might be doing maybe one, maybe two this year. So Fabulous. if timing and, and writing permits, uh, it would be very nice to invite you uh, along to a site for a, for a quick visit. 
and, and perhaps to pick up and tell us what your historic sensations are about the site. I would love that so much. That I'm so glad to hear it. And um, no, I can't think of anything more wonderful actually than visiting uh, a new time team dig site. So yes, you know where I am, Tim. I will be there like a shot once we're allowed out. <laughs> <laughs> Kate, thank you very much for your time. Best wishes for the City of Tears and your wonderful group of characters. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again uh, in the future sometime. Lovely. Thanks very much, Tim, and everybody at Time Team. We can't do any of this work without you, so please subscribe, back us on Patreon, and make sure that Time Team comes back again.